Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Alice, myself, and Mark, I want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we gather to spend time in his word. The goal being, well, it says that the goal of our instruction is love. So that's pretty simple, that we might know God's love for us more and more, and that we might learn to love more and more. So we're just blessed to be with you again as we continue on. We're, we've been studying for the last few weeks. We're actually getting into, and we'll be for quite some time, into the Sermon on the Mount. And a couple of weeks ago, we started the Beatitudes. And last week, we started, we were working on, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we didn't finish that up, so we're going to pick up and get back into that a little bit here. But before we do that, Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Well, Lord, we're here to study your word. Just open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to what you have in store for us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All right. As I said, we last, the last program was all about blessed are those who mourn. We talked about mourning. Mm -hmm. And I want to pick up kind of where we left off. But we're, now we're talking about the other half of that is, for they shall be comforted. Yes. God doesn't leave us in mourning. You know, it says that, 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 that weeping may last for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. When the light comes, the joy comes. All right? And I was talking about, in the Gospel of Mark, in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, the account of when, when Jesus, you know, he had been called to the house of uh, Jairus because his daughter was ill, and it turns out she, they get a message while he's going. That she had that she had passed all right and he goes Jesus goes to that house and here's what it says in Mark 5 taking the child by the hand he said to her Talitha kum which translated means little girl I say to you arise and immediately the girl rose and began to walk for she was 12 years old and immediately they were completely astounded see now the people had all been mourning her, her death. Christ doesn't respect death. He conquered death. Oh, man. Okay? The mourning of the world, and even religious people, more often than not, is sympathy, and it is powerless. Now, there's a difference between sympathy and compassion. You know, if something bad happens to somebody here in English, we, we say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't quite understand that. In Spanish, they say "lo siento," which literally means "I," which literally means "I feel it." Right. Compassion is when it when it when you feel what somebody is going through. All right. So, Jesus is compassionate, but he is all powerful, and he said, "I came to bring life." He conquered death. I mean, how, how wonderful the statements of the Apostle Paul are. You know. Oh, death, where is I victory? Death, where is I sting? Death has been conquered. You see, the power of Jesus Christ, Paul talks to the Philippians and talks about the resurrection power of, of Jesus Christ. All right, so he doesn't bring pity and sympathy. He comes with the resurrection power. And he doesn't sound sympathetic at all, talking, you know, a man came to him and said, you know, I want to follow you. Right. Here's what it says, right? And then one of the, another disciple said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Matthew 8, 21 and 22. Now, you know, the Jewish custom is somebody dies, boom, they, they do the burial. Right. Same so, day. so this man, his, his father had passed right then. I mean, this is, you know, and Jesus says, no, you, you follow me. I, I'm reminded of when, I, I guess it was the women, went, were going to the tomb where Jesus had been buried. And they encounter an angel who says, mm -hmm. why do you seek the living among the dead? Yeah. We are a people of life. 
because we have been given eternal life as the free gift of God. The Father gave us that through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. We are a religion of life. Hallelujah. You know, I don't want I don't want to, as I say this all the time, I don't want to sidetrack myself, and then I go ahead and sidetrack myself. But I was thinking this week in praying with all the things that are going on with radical Islam around the world. Well, the only, and I, I say this all the time, you know, okay, the world, the powers of the world are trying to figure out how do we deal with this, how do we deal with this. What they don't understand and are unable to understand because it says the natural man cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually appraised, is what's really, first of all, our, our warfare is not against flesh and blood. I'm talking about ours, the, right. the people of God, but against powers and principalities. And the weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful. Mm -hmm. This is a spiritual battle, and the world doesn't understand that. And the only thing that can, can deal with a spiritual situation is a spiritual answer. Mm -hmm. The only true defense against radical Islam is radical Christianity. That's right. Now, I'm, I'm not going to get into that in, in too much depth, but think about it. Pray about it. You know, have conversations with the Lord about this. And I've said, I've said so many times, I don't ask you to take my word for anything. Test everything. That's what, that's what it says. Examine all things and hold fast to that which is good. Yes? Yes. 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 Okay. So test it. Go talk to the Lord about what I'm about to say to you. We need that same radical commitment to Jesus Christ that those radical Islamists have to their false God. We need to have that same commitment. But Jesus, where they come to bring death, Jesus said, I came to bring life. That's what this is about. Blessed are those who mourn. It is about death. And we can talk all day about death. You know, it's, it's, it's sad that people die in their sins because they don't have to, all right? But we are to bring the word of eternal life. You know, I'm sure you know the encounter that Jesus had where he says to his, uh, his apostles, who do the people say I am? And they go through this litany. They say you're a prophet. You know, you're, you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. You're Jeremiah. And then Jesus looks at him and he says, who do you say I am? And Peter says to him, you are the Christ, the Son of God, right? That's who he is, who came to bring life. He is the Son of the living God. He is God. When people were leaving him because his word was too difficult, he said to them, will you also leave? And they said, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. These are the words of eternal life. We have a ministry of reconciliation. We have the, the we have been entrusted with God's word. He has written his word on the tablets of his heart, our hearts. He has poured his love into our hearts through his Holy Spirit. We have been given those eternal words to go out and not sympathize with the dead, but to use that resurrection power of God's word and call people into eternal life. To raise the dead. At any cost to ourselves. And that is so much of what the Sermon on the Mount is about. Mm. Praise God. It's not sympathy that the Lord offers. It's life that he offers to whosoever will receive it. You know, Job had sympathizers. You know the story of Job? Man, you would talk about having some, some issues. Job had some issues, but his sympathizers for all the good they did him, what, what did they do for him? Nothing. They made him miserable, all right? But then there was a young man called Elihu came along, and Elihu brought the life-giving word of God, and he confronted Job with it. You know, he didn't sit there and sympathize, oh, poor Job, look at what has happened to you, look what you're going through. He brought the word of God in power. And after that, that brought, all of a sudden, now you see God himself having a conversation with Job. Why? Because Elihu had set it up. You know, you can go out and talk to somebody about, about the Lord. And that could lead them into having conversations with the Lord, life-giving conversations with the Lord. All right. 
the word could be the spark and but, ignites. You know, we should have that same attitude that was in Elihu. Here's what Elihu said. He said, for I'm full of words. The spirit within me constrains me. Behold, my belly is like unvented wine, like new wineskins. It's about to burst. Let me speak that I may get relief. Let me open my lips and answer. Let me now be partial to no one nor flatter any man. For I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. Do you have that compulsion? Do you, are you filled with God's word and God's love so you can't restrain yourself from speaking those words of life to the people who need to hear it? Or are we trying to please men? That's what, that's what Elihu said. If I, was, if, I, if I was flattering, if I was concerned about what people thought of me, my maker would soon take me away. Mm. Sympathy. Poor baby. Poor baby. Coddles the flesh. Yes, it does. Which is destined to perish. While comfort, rise and be healed, stirs the spirit. You know, I, I had this conversation with Alice a long time ago, because I know what my flesh is like, okay? Hallelujah for the strength of the Spirit of God within me. But my, from, from many years of being unsaved, I knew, you know, if I, don't, if I wake up in the morning, I don't feel good. I want to lay there in bed, and I want to say, oh, I want Alice to come up to me and say, oh, poor baby, you want some hot chocolate? That's what, that's what my flesh likes, you know. I, that's that, that sympathy. And I told her, here's the deal. If I do that, I want you to come up to me. Look at me with those loving eyes. And I want you to say to me, rise and be healed in the name of Jesus. Because that's what I need to hear. I don't need sympathy. I need the comfort of God's word, the power of God's word in my life. And so do you. And so does everybody else out there. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus, when he was on the way, and we talked about this a little bit last week, when he was on the way to the tomb to call Lazarus, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yes. And he encountered Martha, Lazarus' sister. He said to her, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. John eleven twenty five. You have... If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't, you know what? Do it now. Turn, turn this thing off. Take a break. Take a break. Amen. Turn this off. Go get on your face before God. Amen. And cry out to receive that wonderful yes. gift of eternal life that he sent his son Jesus to go to the cross in your place oh. to give you. Thank you, Lord. You see, the morning... Blessed are those who mourn. The mourning that the Lord blesses mm -hmm. can coexist with the joy that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the heart of the Father who is patient. And as Peter said, does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance so that they have everlasting life. 2 Peter 3.9. It's the mind of Christ. It says in Isaiah 53, the prophecy, the most beautiful prophecy of Jesus, says he was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrows is acquainted with grief. And like, like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. He took upon himself the chastisement for us all. The shortest verse, John eleven thirty five, 35, in that account of Lazarus, Jesus wept. You know, but it's followed by the comfort. It says that for the sufferings, just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.5 Jesus had, I mean, pain for the people who refused to accept God the Father's love that was expressed in him. That's suffering, but there's comfort on the other side of it. You see, Paul, and remember, Paul was bold enough to say that we should imitate him, even as he imitated Christ, right? He mourned for his countrymen who had not accepted their Messiah. Isn't that true? Yes. People think that Paul was anti-Jewish, anti which is the most ridiculous thing in the world. 
you know, here's the, the fact, and this is the heart of God the Father, who has not rejected his people, all right? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrepentable. Irre right? Paul said, I am telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple services and the promises. Romans chapter 9. Go read it. First four verses. Where is that heart? Where is, where is that grief? Where is that pain in our hearts for the lost? I mean, you know, we have these evangelical or evangelism programs. You know, we're going to have coffee and donuts and hot dogs, you know, and go invite a friend. You know, a, a ministry of repentance is to get in somebody's face. This is radical Christianity. And tell them that time is running short. That today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. But now is the time to receive the love of God. We're pitter-pattering around because, you know, we're more interested in filling our church buildings than we are having people go to the kingdom of heaven for eternity. See, our, our mourning has to be active and alive, and the cause of our comfort has to be proclaimed. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What is the cause of our comfort? It is the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So at the end of Matthew... Jesus said to the apostles, to his disciples, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. So at the end of this glorious gospel of Matthew, he is sending them out to bring what? Well, let me just say this first of all. You see, Jesus went, as we talk about, Jesus went to the house of Jairus. Yes. Jesus went to Bethany mm -hmm. for Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Jesus traveled from heaven to earth Us. to raise me mm -hmm. from the dead. Amen. You, mm -hmm. you, and you. He traveled because you were dead walking in your transgressions. He didn't come to sympathize and say, oh, poor babe. He came to proclaim, boldly and powerfully proclaim that everlasting word to raise you. That's the resurrection power. You know, I, I, I wanted to take just a, a minute. We've been studying this, and we are going to continue to study this. As I said, we, we're going verse by verse, oftentimes word by word, because words are important. But there's a danger in that if we don't recognize the fact that there is a context to this. Yes. You know, two programs ago we talked about blessed are the poor in spirit. If you, and it, by the way, if you haven't done this recently, it would do you well to do it. Sit down, take a few minutes, and read the entire Sermon on the Mount, right? Mm -hmm. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And by the way, that entire sermon... Want to, want to do something? Take it and read it out loud yes. and see how long it takes. It probably won't take you more than 10, 15 minutes. All right? So when people were hearing this, when the disciples were hearing this the first time, mm -hmm. they're hearing the whole thing. Yes. All right? So, you know, I don't want to separate, like, the poor spirit from what Jesus <laughs> talks about later when he talks about the love of God, you know, that look how he takes care of the birds. Look at the grass right. of the field, all right? right? Because we have the riches of Christ. And he talks about the danger of serving, serving mammon, the wealth, the world's wealth. And so that's the context of this, yes. all right? Yes. When we talk about here, you know, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I'm talking about, well, now that we got to go <clears throat> out and bring, the comfort is seeing, if it, if it doesn't give you joy to see somebody accept Jesus Christ, and have that eternal life in them. There's something wrong with you. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's just the plain, simple truth. 
There shouldn't be anything that gives you greater joy on this planet than to share the Word of God with somebody and see them accept and receive eternal life through the grace of, and work of Jesus Christ. New birth. Well, new, that should give you great, great joy. Yes. Right? Well, the comfort comes and the power comes from in the Sermon on the Mount. When we get into it a little bit more, when he's saying to these same apostles, he's saying, you, now you, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. You're going to go out there. You're going to bring this message, life-giving life message to others. That's the context of this. It doesn't just stop here. So when we look at these things piece by piece, remember that there's a whole message. And the whole message is so important. Yes. Right? Absolutely. When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? Somebody who didn't know. And you know, it should be obvious to you who knows the Lord and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. Especially in these troubling last days. I mean, it is... There, I, I was talking the other day about, you know, we have an upward call. That's what Paul says in Philippians. Mm -hmm. You know, the calling of God in our lives is an upward call. But the world is in a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. So the world and the Word are getting farther and farther apart, moment by moment. Yes. It's like you can't turn on the television without seeing filth. No. You can't turn, I mean, you can't open a magazine or a newspaper. The <clears> world is going, falling deeper and deeper into depravity moment by moment. You're the only hope. Now you know, because the great danger is simply not ISIS or Al-Qaeda or Islamic terrorism. You may think it is, but it depends on whether you're not you're a Bible believer. Because Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. The great, great danger is eternal death. To die without having accepted Jesus. And you know, Paul says, how, how are they going to save? How are they going to be saved? You know, it says that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. you got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. How are they, but Paul said, how are they going to believe if they don't hear? And how are they going to hear if it's not proclaimed? That's what it says. And how is it going to be proclaimed if nobody's sent? Well, you're the one that's sent. You are that vessel that is filled with a treasure. It's not just a pastor standing behind a pulpit. You know, his job is to equip you to go out and do the work of service. We put this burden on the pastors that is not scriptural. We are his hands and we are his feet. We are his hands and we are his feet. That's right. Give the good news to all that you meet. That's right. Ambassadors of love. Ambassadors of peace. Ambassadors of love. That sounds like a nice song. <laughs> <laughs> it is. When was the last time? Are you afraid of how they'll receive it? Are they afraid that they'll, that you, you know, they'll think that you're a fanatic? People have called me a religious fanatic many, many times, and my only answer to that is thank you. That's my only answer. You know, Winston Churchill, the, the Prime Minister of England through the Second World War, he once said that a fanatic is a person who cannot change his mind and will not change the subject. And what we're doing is we're presenting them with facts, which they can either reject or accept. Well, you know, I don't, I don't want to be feeble. We've been filled with power. Paul wrote to Timothy, and I talk about Paul a lot, obviously, but Paul wrote to Timothy and said, we've not been given a spirit of fear, of timidity. Sure. Sure. We've been given boldness. We've been given power. Mm -hmm. And the power we have, in, you know, it's not just in word, but in power. Right? Yes, yes. We have been given the power to go out and proclaim the love of God. And that is the power of life. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that you're here? So you can get a better job, a better house, a nicer car. You are here because you are an ambassador for Christ. We are here because we are supposed to bring the fragrant aroma of the knowledge of Christ Jesus in every place. We are here. We talked about this a little bit last week. But we are here to bring the love of God into every place. Amen. That's why you're here. Yes. So are you doing that? Because, you know, you've been given this time on earth. You've been given this. It's a gift from God. It's a gift from God to fulfill a ministry. Because you'd be better off if he took you right now. Mm, that's right. That's well, it's, right. it's true. 
But do we think that way? I don't think that we generally do. It is time for us to realize our purpose, our, the, the function that God has given us. Because if we're not doing that, we are ineffective. We have been given something, and from whom much has been given, much is required. What did God tell you as soon as you got saved? One of the first things. You've had your life. You've had your life, and now it's mine. That's, that, was, that should be the mindset of everybody. Well, it should be. You're absolutely right. Because, you know, why can't we all say, as Paul did, for, for I have died and my life is hidden in Christ. You're not your own. You've been purchased with a price. You are here as an ambassador. And by the way, that should separate you from the world. Yes, it is. You know, we've lived in foreign countries. We've spent a lot of time in foreign countries. A lot of time in foreign countries. Mm -hmm. We lived like in, in Central America, living in Belize. Spent a lot of time in the United Kingdom. When we were there, we were submissive to the laws. Yes. Probably more submissive than most of the citizens of the nation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, actually did the speed limit. Actually, you know, do all the things. Pay the taxes that you have to pay while you're there. But the fact is, I couldn't vote because I'm not a citizen. Philippians 3.20 says, my citizenship is in heaven. So I didn't participate in that. I was there as an alien, a sojourner, a stranger. I was there to represent. I wasn't there to represent the United States. I wasn't there to represent democracy. I was there to represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I was there to represent the King of Glory. I was there to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's why you are here. You know, you may not, when you go to work in the morning, what do you think you're there for? Well, to I got to earn a living, otherwise I'm, no, you're not to earn a living. Go read the Sermon on the Mount. God, that's what God is saying through Jesus when he says, look at how he takes care of the birds. Doesn't he love you more than that? He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. You are here with a mission and a ministry. Every Christian is here with a mission and a ministry. And it is to be used by God for his purpose, not for, your, not for you to use yourself for your own purpose. Mm -hmm. We need to get back to radical Christianity. It is the only solution to the radical evil world. Yes. Fanatic. Fanatic comes from a, from a Latin word that means inside the temple. The opposite of that is, is profane, to be outside the temple. You're either, you're either inside or you're outside. You can't have one foot in and one foot out. You know, everybody is a fanatic about for something. something. Yeah, for something. It could be for your faith. It could be for your football team. Very likely for your football team. Everybody is a And the thing that you're most fanatical for is your religion. And that's well, the one you talk about all the time. Yeah. You always talk about the one you love. That's right. Or the thing that you love. That's the truth. That's the truth. Could it be your car. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't know who we're getting short on time, but I do remember going back, way back. I mean, this is going back into the, to the 70s when Alice uh, and I first got saved mm -hmm. and she was working at the telephone company. Mm -hmm. We had been very much into motorcycles. Yes. She talked to people about motorcycles. Yeah. And one day she realized that she was ready to talk about that at a, a, drop, at of a drop of a hat. hat. That's right. But she needed to be ready to talk to people about Jesus the same way. You need to be ready in season and out to talk about Jesus because we are a peculiar people who have been called out by the Lord, called to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So, Father, I pray that we would walk in the power that you've given us. I pray, Lord God, that we would be committed to you regardless of the cost, Lord God, that we would share the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might see the spiritually dead, spiritually raised into eternal life. Hallelujah. God bless you and goodbye till next time. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners